talking to us today. Uh, please welcome Alistair Allen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so unlike a lot of the things we're talking about here, this is not a talk you'll take away and use in the next couple of weeks, or possibly not even in the next couple of years. This is a talk about future tech. But I'm starting to think it's actually future technology that we have to think about now, today, because the architectures we're building um, for the Internet of Things, in fact, are going to fundamentally affect the way we live our lives over the next 10 or 20 years. And quite frankly, I think we're doing it wrong. So I think a lot about the future. And because of that, I've gained somewhat of a reputation for making good predictions. But since this is a characteristic I share with prophets, messiahs, and other ne'er wells I'm not sure entirely what to think about that. Nonetheless, in my old age, at least for the computing industry, I'm getting increasingly frustrated with the smart young things. The people that say that they have the solution to today's big problems, and it's going to be tomorrow's big problems, and it's always going to be the solution, and it's the best and only solution. Because those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it endlessly. And those smart thing, young things need to pay more attention. Because the, the underlying trend in the computer industry is, is pretty clear for those that have a good grasp of history. Depending on the state of technology, computing oscillates between thin and thick client architectures. Either the bulk of our compute power and storage is hidden away in racks, perhaps very distant racks, or alternatively, it's in a massive distributed systems much closer to home. And today's reinvention of the mainframe is what? Cloud computing, right? And while I'm a big supporter of cloud architectures, at least at the moment, I'm going to be interested to see those preaching it as a solution for all time Prove wrong yet again when computing power reaches the point where that data center will fit in my pocket. And if you think that couldn't happen, you should think again, because of course it already has. The iPad beat out, would beat out most supercomputers from the early 90s and would actually be well up in the top 500 list all the way up into the mid to late 90s. And there isn't any reason to suspect, at least in the, for now, that this isn't this trend isn't going to continue. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some physics problems coming up, um, but I think it's reasonable we can assume to work around them. And the, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we can do to fix that, and I can have that argument with you if you really want to have that argument. But if that's true, then that means the desktop is going to increasingly belong to niche users. It isn't dead, but it's going to live on in the exact same way the mainframe lives on, which is hidden behind the scenes, backstage, quietly. Developers like me and probably most of you guys, well, and a few other people will still need it, at least for now. But, but despite the prevalent view in Silicon Valley, the world is not full of those people. For the rest of the world, well, the next big thing is just that. It's things. Our computing is slowly diffusing out into our environment. And for the most part, apart from a few conferences where the great and the good are congregated to talk about this sort of stuff, it's happening quietly behind the scenes. But everyday objects are already getting smarter, and in 10 years' time, everything, every piece of clothing you have, every piece of jewelry you wear, everything you carry with you will be smart. It'll be calculating, measuring, and weighing your life. In 10 years' time, the world, your world, is going to be full of sensors. Now, right now, most of these sensors live in our cell phones. And each of these cell phones now come with accelerometers, gyroscopes, magnetometers. Some come with thermometers, pressure sensors, humidity sensors, NFC. The, it's a very long list. But they're still computers. And people never really wanted computers. They wanted what computers could do for them. You really only have to look at someone trying to install printer drivers on Windows to know that nobody actually wanted computers. Techno technology is only really mature when it's invisible, when you don't have to bother with it anymore. And of course, today's mobile devices like this, the ubiquitous black rectangle, as they've all become, are transition devices, artifacts of the stage of our technological progress. This too will pass and eventually fade into its own niche. Because this isn't a mobile phone. This is just a computer that happens to be able to make phone calls. And that's a very different thing entirely. 
And despite the apparent stability of this form factor that we've seen over the last couple of years since Apple changed everything, this is not going to last as long as the beige box that sat under your desk for 15, 20 years. How long was that form factor with us? Just too long. And certainly not as long as most analysis think. So right now, sensors outside of smartphones sort of look like this. These are four of the sensor modes uh, I, along with the rest of the data sensing lab team, took to Google, Google I.O. last year, um, where we mesh networked the entire of Moscow and West for environmental data. And they measured uh, temperature, pressure, humidity, light, ambient noise, RF noise, motion, um, and one more I can never remember. Um, anyway, it was a whole bunch of data. There was like 20, 25 million data points at the end of the conference. But like the early mobile phones, like those huge big bricks that no one really carried, these aren't game changers. And nor is this, but it's a lot closer to where I think we're going. This is a Bluetooth low energy presence sensor. It's about the size of a quarter, if you can't really get the scale there. Effectively, it's the tracking dot that superheroes used to put under their enemies' cars when we like the, the, the cartoons when we were kids. That's effectively what it is. It's, as well as range finding, as a piezo buzzer, an LED, and a temperature sensor. It, it's a pretty simple bit of tech, but it's a lot closer to being invisible, and we'll sit and run there in a, a LiPo for a year or two years. And that's something that's going to be important, because the interfaces we see today are going away. Buttons. Buttons are a great hack. It's a great UI convention, like buttons. In fact, the whole desktop power computing paradigm, it's a hack. It's a great hack, but it's going to go away. But the devices, the computing behind those interfaces aren't going to go away. They're going to just become invisible. We're still essentially the banging the rocks together stage for this sort of stuff. And you haven't really seen anything yet. So this is closer to the end of the vision. This is this powder-sized chip, um, and that's a salt crystal. So this is a small thing. It's something called the Mu chip from Hitachi. It's the smallest commercially available RFID system in the world and can be pulse powered by radio waves. It doesn't require a battery. You can literally scatter this stuff like dust or embed it into a sheet of paper. And you know what the really interesting thing about this technology is? This was commercially released 10 years ago. So the inevitability of smart dust. So what is smart dust? Well, smart dust, of course, isn't a new concept. It's the originated with DARPA back in the 90s. And it's general purpose computing, sensors, wireless network, networking, all bundled up into millimeter scale sensor modes, drifting in the air currents, flex of computing power settling on your skin, ingested, monitoring you inside and out. And if you don't think that's possible, this is the Michigan micro mode. It's a cubic millimeter in size. And uh, in deference to the speaker before, yes, it runs an ARM processor. Um, it's a tiny computer, and it features data pro uh, processing, data storage, wireless comms. And it's probably as close to the true smart dust vision from the early DARPA days as we've come so far. They're designed to harvest energy from the environment around them and to communicate via mesh network. And of course, the energy is the key problem with this. You can make the computing small, the energy is hard. Anyone that's actually taken a laptop or their cell phone apart will know that the, the size of the board compared to the size of the batteries is a big deal. So think tiny solar cells for power. And although that's not the only route, there are a whole bunch of other passive energy generation te techniques, like vibration harvesting, for instance, have already been scaled down quite nicely. And the sort of minute amounts of energy they generate are actually quite well suited to the minute amount of power that this sort of thing needs. Um, and of course, at least for medical or, or bio use, the, the body heat is another obvious potential energy source after how much sunlight are you going to get and inside an intracranial bleed. And more importantly, this is actually something that really excited me at the tail end of the year. This is a, a prototype of an ambient backscatter device, and it's from a team at the University of Washington. They're using existing TV and uh, cell transmissions, ambient RF energy, effectively, that's already in the air, air around us, not just to power the devices, but also as the communication medium by reflecting or absorbing the pre-existing radio signals. So unlike NFC, where power is supplied by a reader, 
here neither the reader nor the transmitter are powered. Both devices are battery free. And while the data rates are fairly low, as you might imagine, they're communicating much higher rates than NFC is, uh, is capable of, with reliable transmission maybe a couple of feet. And that's pretty impressive, especially for something that's still an academic project. And you can imagine embedding this sort of technology inside concrete walls, for instance. And the immediate question is, well, wait, will, will it actually get the radio waves inside concrete walls? Well, do you still have a cell signal in here? If so, then yes. You can embed these into walls as the buildings are put up. So it's going to be a true smart building at that point. So today we own and carry plenty of appliances that contain computers. We drive cars that contain computers. Computer run things like our traffic lights, our elevators. We're sort of used to be them being everywhere. But I want you to imagine for a moment if there were a computer in literally every object in your house, in your office, in your neighborhood. Imagine computers were in the wind. Imagine if they were literally ubiquitous. They would be pretty something. And it would drive a huge amount of change. This is what I packed to come here to Mexico, and I travel with infrastructure. Um, and if computing was truly ubiquitous, none of this would be necessary. And that gets to the heart of the sea change that this sort of technology is going to bring. Sure, we can connect a bunch of things to the internet, but that's not particularly interesting. It's not so much about connecting things to the internet, it's about putting computing power and sensing everywhere. Today's big thing is big data. But we're not really thinking big enough when we think about big data. Almost inevitably, the amount of data that the Internet of Things, let alone any conceived smart dust revolution is going to bring us, will generate a vast amount of data that will, that, that will exceed anything that can be filtered and distilled into a remote database. The phrase data exhaust will no longer be a figure of speech. It will literally be a statement. Your data will exist in a cloud, a halo of devices surrounding you has to provide you with, with center and computer support as you walk along, calculating constantly, consulting one another, predicting, anticipating your needs. You'll be surrounded by a web of distributed sensors, computing, and data, and hopefully won't actually need all the clunky UI things that we've become used to. But that's not all. If you assume the existence of ubiquitous computing, you can assume a whole bunch of other things. The, the change, the, the availability of sensors on the micro scale actually changes a whole bunch of, something, of, of things on the macro scale. Robots, for instance, on an assembly line are no longer required to be individually smart. You can assume sensors are available. You can assume the computing support is available. And that has a lot of possibilities and a lot of problems because it leads to the standards problem. And, and more than once or twice today, the consortium problem has been mentioned. Right now, the IoT, the Internet of Things, is fundamentally broken. Things don't talk to one another. Most systems are built today around the notion of the person being part of the system, being participants in the conversation with the system. We've made ourselves mechanical Turks inside our own software. Worse yet, we've made ourselves mechanical Turks inside other people's software which is a fundamental architecture problem, although that's a whole different talk that possibly some of you in the audience might have heard already. Um, and there are two ways that this could go, and don't make the mistake in thinking the decisions we're making today with the Internet of Things aren't going to affect that. Whether the architectures for smart dust works in a peer-to-peer -peer manner to make computing power and sensing available to individuals or whether the network architectures will centralize command and control into a few hands, the only real question is who will have access to sensors, the computing power, and to the data that is generated. Personally, for one, I, I don't want a world where the Google smart dust and the Microsoft smart dust are having a battle for my temperature reading on my skin. The diffusion of computing into the environment will mean not just the computing is always available, but also the computing offers the possibilities of continuous monitoring and surveillance. This is the promise of the IoT. It's the threat of the IoT. And we have to think carefully about the architectures we're putting together for these sort of, these sort of things now, because we will go there no matter what we decide, one way or the other. And we had the first tenuous glimpse of this reaction to that when Google bought Nest, and people started to panic about their data and privacy. 
I'm not quite sure why it took Google buying Nest when Nest was not collecting any more data than they were before, but that's what it took. Of course, I could be wrong. Yesterday's next big thing was the World Wide Web. And I vividly remember standing in a very drafty computing lab more than 20 years ago now, looking over someone's shoulder as they downloaded the very first build of Nazca Mosaic via some torturous method I'm not going to go into. I shook my head and said, it'll never catch on. Who wants images anyway? And to be fair, I was a lot younger back then. We all were. And I was failing to grasp history because I was neither well-read enough nor old enough to have seen it all before. And since I don't claim to either be well-read enough or old enough to have seen it all before this time, possibly you should take everything I'm saying with a pinch of salt. But saying that, about a year ago, I came across a rather beautiful series of French and, and German postcards from the early 1900s predicting what things would be like in the year 2000s. They almost got it right. This is one of the French cards predicting the Roomba. <laughs> That's pretty good going. That's 100 years of technological development they managed to predict. This is a German postcard from the same period as the French one in the last slide. This was put out as a promotional item from the Hildebrand's German Chocolates Company. No, I don't know why either. Um, the cards in this series were mostly concerned with the technology of travel. And in some ways, they're really rather short-sighted. Because we don't do that, right? That's not even close to what we do. This is how we walk on water. <laughs> but we didn't have jet lev in 1900. They didn't have anything like that. What they had were balloons and carriages and boats. So they took what they had and they imagined it smaller. And they put them together. And that sort of makes sense. So the smart people in the audience have probably figured out where I'm going with this. This Isn't this the exact same argument I'm following here about smart dust and the Internet of Things? So Julie Steele, uh, a good friend of mine who's the person that pointed me towards these postcards, actually had something pretty smart to say about them. Sometimes you can predict the what even if you don't know the how. And after all, those Germans managed to predict Amazon. That's the shops coming to you. So computing is evolving constantly. Mainframes to desktops to laptops to cell phones to your bloodstream to literally blowing in the wind around you. And I guess the takeaway from this talk is that the things we're building now, today, and talking about here at MakerCon and, and the other conferences are, are basic building blocks, blueprints, if you like, essentially forerunners of the smart dust we're going to be living with 10 or 20 or maybe a bit longer down the road. And the architectural choices we're making today to build the Internet of Things are fundamentally going to affect the way those endpoint devices, the mature technology, looks. And I'm scared about the way we're making some of those architectural choices about the Internet of Things. So if you're a startup building Internet of Things things, or if you're a bigger corporation, if you are one of those huge consolidated conglomerates of huge corporations, sit back. Think about the sort of world you want to live in. Because the choices you're making are going to change the world. And right now, as far as I'm concerned, the Internet of Things people, and I include myself here because I do a bunch of Internet of Things things, aren't making good choices. But again, that's a whole nother talk. So I want you to think about the kinds of information we approximate, guess at, or determine by polling and sampling, and then making a calculation. In the future, we won't have to calculate things. We can just measure them, because the sensors will be everywhere. And if you can measure something, you can change it. And very soon, you'll be able to change just about everything. Thank you. <laughs>